Okay, my name's Charlie Post. I'm an editor of Spectre, a new Marxist journal that's been appearing now for about two and a half years. And Spectre, along with Haymarket Books, one of the foremost socialist publishing houses in the uh, English-speaking world at the moment, are welcoming you to this book launch of Kim Moody's new book, Breaking the Impasse, Electoral Politics, Mass Action, and the New Socialist Movement in the U.S. that was just published by Haymarket. Um, excuse me. We have a really excellent panel today, and let me introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. First, of course, is the author, Kim Moody, who's going to take a few minutes, about 20 minutes when I'm done, to introducing the book. Kim was a founder of Labor Notes in the U.S. and has been the author of almost a half dozen books on labor and politics, including this most recent, Breaking the Impasse, but also recently, Tramps and Trade Union Travelers, Internal Migration and Organized Labor in the Gilded Age, which came out in 2017, and New Terrain, How Capital is Reshaping the Battleground of the Class War, all from Haymarket. He holds a PhD from the University of Nottingham and is currently a visiting scholar at the University of Westminster in London. He's a member of the University and College Union and the National Union of Journalists. Our next speaker is Kian Liberata. Kian's a railway construction, track construction worker and president of Track Local 3012 of the Teamsters Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division. He is a co-founder and co-chair of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division, IBT Rank and File United Reform Caucus. And Liberato is also a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, where he served as a member of the National Political Committee from 2020 to 2021. Our next speaker will be Joe Burns. Joe is a veteran union negotiator and labor lawyer with over 25 years of experience negotiating collective bargaining agreements. He's currently the director of collective bargaining <coughs> for the Association of Flight Attendants, which is associated with the Communication Workers of America. He graduated from the New York University School of Law. Prior to law school, he worked as a public, in a public sector hospital and was the president of his Ask Me Local. He is the author of Class Struggle Unionism, Strike Back, Rediscovering Militant Tactics to Fight the Attack on Club Employees Unions, and Reforming the Strike, How Working People Can Regain Power and Transform America. And our last commentator is Lois Weiner. She's Professor Emeritus at New Jersey City University, is a career teacher, education researcher, and teacher union activist. Her new book, as yet untitled, takes up what the left can learn about defending social justice and workers' rights by examining capitalist's latest proposal project to deprofessionalize teaching and undercut teacher labor activism and destroy public education. Chapters one and two have already been published by both New Politics, of which Lois is an editor, and Tempest. All right, Kim, you've got about 20 minutes to introduce your book and give us some idea of why you wrote it and what you're arguing. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you, Lois, Kian, and Joe for agreeing to do this. Uh, you know, uh, I do really appreciate it. And thanks to Haymarket and Spectre for putting this on. All right, why did I write such a book? Well, uh, first of all, I do have to say this book was actually written quite a while ago. It takes forever to get through the uh, publishing process. So there's some things in there that are a little out of date, which I confess to begin with. Um, but in any case, why did I write it? Well, like everybody else in, in the United States, although I'm not in the United States, I'm still very concerned with what goes on in, in the United States. Uh, I was you know, uh, in, inspired even, and, and given a lot of hope by the rise of a new socialist movement in the US. We had not seen anything like this, uh, even in my lifetime, even with SDS and all the things, 60s and 70s. There was never anything that quite reached this, the rapid size of this thing. I suppose SDS came close for a while, but not really. Uh, and, and what seemed like a uh, an incredible development that is a large socialist organization in the United States. Imagine that. Uh, but as I watched this develop, 
um, you know, I could see like any socialist movement, it has its own t different tendencies and, and different directions and developments. And the thing that concerned me most was the electoral direction, which increasingly seems to be the central focus of the organization, not the only focus. Uh, I, I know that there's a, a great deal of other stuff going on in terms of labor work, and working class work, tenants organizing, all of these sort of things which are extremely important. Um, but nonetheless, there is a, a real kind of momentum in terms of electing people through the Democratic Party. Now, I know circumstances are different today as they were different in the 70s and 60s. But to be honest, I've seen it before. And it alarms me a lot because the Democratic Party is, is not some open field in which we can plant whatever uh, crops we wish to, uh, to harvest and so forth. It's a capitalist institution, as, as I'm sure you all agree. Um, you know, and so I tried to write a book that went beyond the usual conventional notion that we have a two-party system because of the first past the post thing and all of that. And look at, well, why did we get to the situation where we have these kind of parties that we do have uh, that are different, actually, from any, anywhere else in the world? There's no other parties that I know of, in, at least in the developed world and most of the less developed countries, that has no membership. Most political parties, whatever they're right, center, or left, actually have members. Republicans and the Democrats have no members. There's no democratic structure to the party. There's no way that people can uh, decide, you know, party members, because there aren't any, decide on who's going to run and what the policies are and, and all of that. Uh, it, it's become a top-down institution. Well, how did this happen? It happened, as I argued, in the, in the beginning in the progressive era, when they introduced these reforms, Elite people, some of them called progressives, introduced reforms that were meant to get rid of the activists of the party, that were meant to reduce the immigrant, and in particular the immigrant vote in the North and the black vote in the South. These things happened at the same time. A lot of people think they're separate. They're not so separate. Uh, and, <clears throat> and, and to turn the, the, the choosing of, of party candidates into an individual thing that we do as a as a individual going into a you know um, a ballot place and and voting like that instead of what they used to have, which were face to face meetings where people fought it out. Yeah, usually the boss won, and and we know the history of corruption and so forth. But there there was mass participation in politics, um, you know, in, in the period before the Progressive Era. That, that is from about 1907 to. Uh, about 1920. So they passed these reforms, the, particularly the direct primary. Now, if you read a lot of things in Jacobin or, or you know, even in uh, various uh, uh, DSA literature, the primary appears as something that is an opening, that it's a gateway, just a simple one. Anybody can do it. You've got your petitions, no problem. But what I'm saying is that not only is that not the case, it wasn't meant to be the case. The opposite was meant to be the case. And that has stood for a long time. They get low turnout. The average electorate is disproportionately well off, uh, disproportionately educated, disproportionately white, and, and all the rest of that in the primaries, even more so than in the, the, the general electorate. Um, and, and so they succeeded in, in actually changing, you know, the, the way parties function and who runs them and, and how people participate in the process of, uh, you know, of politics. Well, okay, we look at that. So we ended up, yes, we have a first pass the post system. But, you know, as I say in there, if you kind of look at around the world, there are other countries that have it that have multi-party systems. I'm in the UK now. There are seven parties sitting in, in the UK Parliament. Okay, there are two major ones, but the other parties have quite a bit to say, and they can knock out some of the, the two big parties, as the Scottish National Party knocked out both the Tories and the Labour Party in Scotland. And I could go into more detail about that. That doesn't happen in the United States because we don't have um, you know, attempts to, to build a mass base that allows you to do that. You can't do that without a mass base. But if you have a mass base, 
you can break through in, in a district. And later, if I have time, I'll talk about the change in the, the way politics are. That we, we don't have a two-party system. We have two-party systems, plural. Uh, that is, we have a lot of congressional districts and, and legislative districts and city councils that belong to one party and not to the other, uh, where the majority is so large that the other party is irrelevant. And the spoiler effect, which is always the big problem with the first pass the post thing, doesn't exist. You know, so what are we waiting for is, is kind of my conclusion on this. Um, and what we're waiting for actually is more of a mass base. All right. So I think we've had another change in, in politics that I try to go through, and it's related to a change in the capitalist class itself. Uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, the rise of a whole new section of super rich billionaires, multimillionaires, et cetera, in, in kind of industries like finance and high tech and uh, uh, things like that. Um, and you know some of the names of these people. Uh, what perhaps you don't know is that these people give millions, not hundreds of thousands anymore, but millions of dollars to the parties, not just the candidates, to the party. The Democratic Party rests its organization, which is quite sophisticated, huge. Their budget for 2020 was $1.8 billion. Uh, and <clears throat> it rests on money from people who have money. Yeah, they get a lot of small donations, too, but those have actually been bypassed by large donations in, in the whole electoral system. So the whole thing is, is, you know, I would say basically corrupt. The other thing is what I call stealth realignment. The Democrats were once considered the party of the working class, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. It was never true, but there was some evidence that at least working class people voted for the Democrats. This isn't even true anymore. They've lost a lot of their base, not only among white workers, more and more black and, and Latinx people are not voting Democratic or not voting. And so the, the electorate that the Democrats go after to get their majority has been now for the last decade or two, increasingly well-to-do suburbanites and well-to-do urbanites too, by the way. Uh, and that's, that's their strategy. And, you know, it's, it's not changing. So I think... What we have now is, is a party that is essentially impenetrable, if it ever was. And we could go through all the movements that tried to do this in the past, and none of them succeeded for, for the reasons I'm talking about, which are more extreme now. The money is more extreme. The well-to-do electorate is more extreme. The organization of the party structure, elite organization, is more extreme. All of these things are, are different uh, from the what they used to be. So what I'm saying is, and what has always been true in, in US history, is that social change comes through mass disruption, through mass movements from below. You can go all the way back to the abolitionists, to the Civil War itself, to the labor movements that arose in, in the uh, uh, late 19th century and so forth. Certainly, in the, in the examples I use in the book are the 1930s and the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. The legislation that we got in those two periods was gotten by these movements, not by people who were elected. The civil rights movement, the people who made the civil rights movement couldn't vote. That was the fact of that. And so we had to, uh, they had to fight to get the vote. The vote came after winning the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Act and so forth. These were, of course, not the total changes that were needed, but they, they were um, important and it was a mass movement. I spend a good deal of time in the book describing how uh, I see that as, as happening. Same thing with the 30s and labor. When you look at the Congresses that passed both the National Labor Relations Act in the 30s and the Civil Rights Act, these Congresses were not made up of liberal leftists and blah, blah, blah. They were made up of machine politicians, Dixiecrat racists, and, you know, people of that sort, they had to get Republican votes to pass even these things. So, you know, there's a lot of mythology about that. Um, so it's, it's social movements and particularly working class based social movements, which both the CIO and the civil rights movement were essentially working class based. Uh, 
movements, uh, it takes that to make a breakthrough. And so that's kind of what I'm saying about the, uh, uh, you know, the whole way that the left needs to turn uh, away from the specialization on, uh, you know, on this. Now, one of the barriers, uh, here maybe I'm getting a little more controversial, but one of the barriers uh, to why we haven't made these kind of breakthroughs is perhaps ironically, the trade union leadership of the United States historically. I'm not just talking about today, but historically. And particularly once the deal was made in the 30s and 40s that allied the labor leadership and, and the unions formally with the Democratic Party and ruled out explicitly in writing the idea of what they called an ultra-liberal party of the working people. They ruled that out in 1943 when they set up the PAC, the first original PAC. Uh, and the, the problem with that is what it has meant in practice for the working class as a whole and for union members uh, is that the whole business union ideology and practice that comes out is in part a result of that. I won't say that's the only aspect of it, but because they were tied to the Democratic Party and because they saw, big, they gave up the idea of, of legislation uh, for national health care in the 40s and so forth and went for what we have uh, which some people call the private welfare state, where you negotiate all the, the kind of health benefits and everything through the union. Uh, that puts an enormous burden on the union. It also helps create a much larger bureaucracy than you might expect. Uh, and But the business union ideology of being attached to liberals and to the Democratic Party of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and so forth, uh, also led to the notion that you know, basically, the job of the union is not to destroy the company. The job of the union is to go along with the program, to give up the idea of, of striking during a contract by signing a no contract clause, to give up the strength that they once had of, of shop stewards in the workplace by signing a management's right clause, and by the creation of a multi-layer uh, grievance procedure, which takes the resolution of grievances out of the hands of the stewards and so forth. And it's turned the stewards, even who, who are not part of the bureaucracy, but it's turned the stewards into shop floor lawyers instead of workplace leaders. You know, we want to reverse that, don't we? I think everybody that's that's on the, this panel would, would certainly agree with that. That's an element of class struggle unionism that I think uh, you know we would all agree to. Well, the alliance with the Democratic Party is part of the ideology and practice that led the American trade union leadership, with exceptions, there are always exceptions, with exceptions, that has led the bulk of them to even worse things, labor management cooperation programs, the acceptance of wean production, concessions, two tiers, you, you, you know this story. Uh, that is one reason why I think the rank and file approach to union work is absolutely essential. That the rank and file work is, is, isn't directed towards electing Bernie Sanders or something like that, which sometimes you see in literature and so on. But it is political in the sense that uh, it will uh, disrupt this alliance between the unions and the Democratic Party, or should disrupt it. You know, I'm not saying it has, but that, that would be the, the long-term goal of what we're doing in terms of that. Um, all right. The other barrier, and this again goes back to the Democratic Party alliance, is the question of race. And I've, I've devoted a whole chapter to what I call the new de social democratic nostalgia. That is the idea that we can liberate everybody by universal social democratic programs, uh, you know, and that we don't need to pay particular attention to race or identity or, or these kind of politics and so forth. Uh, I think this is utterly wrong. If you look at the upsurges that I'm talking about, uh, African American people and Latino people have played leading roles in these things. They, they couldn't have happened the way, even the upsurge that, that I was able to participate in in the 60s and 70s, you know, without 
the, the civil rights movement and, and the black power movement and these things, these movements would not have been what they were uh, and even had the strength they did as many as that was. And what happened, by the way, to the black power movement? Its death was that its leading politicians all went into the Democratic Party and I could name a lot of them. And, you know, and they ended up, uh, they may still have radical ideas or have had radical ideas ideas, but once you're in the trap of the Democratic Caucus and Congress or wherever, wherever it is, you're no longer free, uh, you know, to do what you want. Uh, so finally, I'll come back to what I was saying sort of in the beginning. I believe the priority now for the socialist movement, which, by the way, is in a bit of a crisis, DSA, a bit of an internal crisis. I'm not saying it's an internal crisis. I hope it isn't, actually. But you can see the, the problems. You can see that the socialists who were elected to Congress are not being particularly uh, radical. Uh, that they are, you know, accommodating to, to the Biden administration and so forth. Um, which doesn't mean they never say good things or even try to do good things. But they're in a context where what they can do is very, very limited indeed. And most important of all, they're not building that mass working class base that everybody talks about. Instead, they're using all these high priced consultants like NPG Van, etc., uh, you know, and spending, raising millions to spend millions. It's like absurd. They have been drawn into the same process, even if they're doing it through small donations, that uh, the rest of the party has. So I see the opening electorally, not immediately. I think I said in the book, maybe 2022. That was clearly naive. But uh, I see the, the opening down the road in these hundreds of one-party districts uh, where there's no spoiler effect, where you could begin to run and build political organizations and begin to run people against you know, the, the Democrats that are not going to do the things we want them to do. They're not going to do the Green New Deal, Medicaid for all, Medicare for all. I mean, and, you know, they're certainly not going to do anything about the police problem, the violence or the incarceration. Um, it's, it's their laws that actually accelerated all that under Clinton and, and Obama didn't do anything about it either. And so if we want progress, it's going to have to come from below. It's going to have to come from mass movements. It's going to have to come from building a working class base that the left, unfortunately, doesn't have right now. Thank you. OK, thank you, Kim. That was really an excellent presentation and summary of the book. We're now going to have three comments. Uh, we're going to start with Kian. You've got about eight minutes to raise comments, criticisms, issues that we need to discuss. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, I don't know if I'll need eight minutes, but um, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Brother Moody, for uh, this text. Um, you know, when I got the book, I, I started reading and I just couldn't put it down. Um, there's a lot of just a lot of things that uh, actually help clarify me and I wear multiple hats. Right. So. On one hand, I'm a trade unionist and uh, in the rail on the rail industry and and uh, a president of a local uh, track union, which to give you an idea, a local president for in the railroad is sort of like something in between being a uh, how can I say it? you work on the tracks every day, so you're still rank and file and you're kind of like a steward, but you have a lot of the responsibilities that a you know, a principal officer would have in terms of maintaining the local, but you get none of the pay, right? So it's kind of a weird kind of uh, uh, a position to be in. Um, and and as I, as mentioned earlier, I did serve in the MPC for DSA, and so it's uh it's very it's very good to be able to read what some of the analysis of uh, some of the challenges that face uh, uh, DSA, uh, what, what they are, um, and, and and I agree with a lot of that, um, but also. I'm wearing a hat as a black worker as well, and so um, it's just it's just the book really kind of hit multiple kinds of angles for me, and and so I'll start with one, and I, I do share the perspective that you know the labor bureaucracy is um, really does hinder the development of independent working class politics, and 
you know, I really saw that play out in the last few years. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively young. So for me, what folks have seen as something that's been playing out over and over again, a lot of it is playing out for the first time for me. Right. I'm seeing it for the first time. So um, I saw it with, in terms of, the, you know, the stuff with the, the Bernie Sanders election uh, primary. And, and I'll just touch on like what the conversations were like at that time. And, and I got to say that the conversation when Bernie Sanders was running um, was very different when talking to the rank and file. At that point, we could talk a little bit about some of these broader working class politics and stuff um, like that. But when, but when that, you know, when the election ended and the 2016 election cycle ended, you know, those conversations went away. You know, and immediately you saw the leadership uh, of our union saying, "Hey, vote for Hillary," and then going to rank and file other rank and file members and saying, hey, you should support Hillary Clinton because, you know, vote your job kind of thing. And the response was just like, hell no, we're not going to do it because they sent the jobs overseas. They did this, they did that, they did that, you know, the whole nine yards. And your response is like, yeah, I know, but, you know, it's better than this person. Right. So um, and, and that's not a winning. Those are not winning arguments to have the same. I saw the same thing happen again in 2020, where there were some pretty rich conversations about what does it mean to have a working class government and what does it mean to have uh, an administration that really supports workers and all that kind of stuff. And then Joe Biden becomes the nominee. And, and the, again, the leadership says, go support Joe Biden. And then the membership says, well, didn't he support NAFTA? Didn't he support all these things that are, you know, that, that are hurting workers and this and that and the third? Is he really a pro-union president? And your response is, well, you know, you know, no, not really. He's not really a pro-worker president, right? Because of all the things that you said, but you should still vote for him anyway. So in that context, it's just like you could not develop. You just saw the opening for developing some kind of working class politics, and then it just foreclosing immediately uh, because there is no independent uh, political party to continue the conversation uh, once the primary is over or once the, the general election is over. So I, I saw that firsthand. Um, I think it's also, the book has also been pretty, was really eye-opening for me, understanding the history of the uh, the primary system and those reforms and how it affected the development of, uh, or I guess the uh, dissolution of, a, of mass party, of the mass party idea in the United States. Um, and so, you know, Oh yeah, and so um, I think for me, what what was particularly uh, sharp about it was seeing that there are that there is a possibility of actually having independent working class politics outside of the the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, even though you have this first past the post system. Which you know, to be fair, I, I've never spent a lot of time trying to understand the electoral system. Um, so <laughs> so seeing that broken down. It, and then seeing what has how things have played out in terms of the last two electoral cycles, and adding in the fact that even with a a, a seriously deep crisis of social reproduction and crisis of economic uh, 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 processes in the United States with the COVID nineteen pandemic, we still could not see basic structural reforms actually happen, be carried out. Um, it, I think it just made it clear that we're not going to see any kind of uh, movement in the direction, in a pro-working class direction, unless there is a, a mass pro-working class movement and organizations of its own. So, um, which challenges quite a bit, uh, quite frankly, my, my, my own caucus as a member of the Bread and Roses caucus, you know, uh, which is a caucus that supports this idea of a dirty break. Um, for me, reading the text was just like, yeah, I think, I think that there is no that I think we just need to go go ahead and build something completely different. And it's going to take a while for us to build the kind of mass base and to build the organizational structures and to actually uh, uh, do this work. But there is no real alternative to doing that work. I don't think there's a shortcut. And so, um, and I'll be, I, have a, I think I have a minute or two. So let me say the chapter on uh, the social democratic nostalgia uh, I thought that was also uh, just a, a really strong chapter, and the way uh, Brother Moody talked about race and how you know you have to look at the history of folks like uh, Bayer Rustin and others and where they came from and what their shifts were in in terms of politics. I thought that was really important because I have seen in DSA uh, as well as other parts of the left a, a kind of a reference back to 
uh, these particular individuals as sort of the, spokes, the spokespersons of, I guess, of sensible black radical politics. And and um, I think uh, uh, I think I think history speaks for itself that you know the the, the struggle. Uh, struggle from below precedes all of the ch uh, all of the changes, and that uh, none of the changes came about came about and actually facilitated those uh, those struggles. So, um, and that's that's basically what I have. Um, that's basically why I wanted to share. I, I think I have two questions though uh, of interest for for Brother Moody, and one is in terms of you know the book touches on the importance of building a, a working class party. And so I'm curious about what does that look like in, in, in more detail in terms of like how do we build that party out of those mass struggles? What is it, you know, what does the nitty gritty of that look like? Um, and are there examples that you would uh, point point us towards? And the second question is in terms of DSA, given all of its various challenges, given the tendencies within the organization, what role might DSA play in terms of helping to build that that independent mass party, uh, working class party, and what do we need to do in order to kind of get to that level uh, to be able to do so? That's all right. Okay, thank you, Kian. Uh, Joe, you're up. <clears throat> okay. Um, first, I want to say that I uh, really enjoyed reading the book. Um, <clears throat> you know, certainly, uh, you know, it's a long line of. Uh, books by Kim Moody that I've learned a lot from. Uh, and one of the great things about Kim's works are they're uh, always chock full of facts and, you know, meticulous research. So it's really good to be able to, you know, I think we know uh, a lot of the issues about the funding of the Democratic Party, um, but to see it put in all, you know, in one place in so much detail is very useful. Um, and I also share the sentiments that, uh, you know, sort of learning, you know, going back and learning the history of it, uh, you know, of the development of the primary system uh, was key. So, um, you know, when I, you know, I think I, I, I like the title of the book too. So breaking the impasse, because I think it really kind of um, sheds a light on, you know, one of, one of the problems when we think about electoral politics, which is, uh, you know, an electoral manifestation of class politics. And, um, you know, I think Kim, you know, talks about it, uh, you know, a, a number of points uh, in the book about the, you know, sort of uh, incorporation of the labor bureaucracy into the Democratic Party and, you know, how strong those ties became. And just to kind of develop it a bit further, maybe a little sharper is, you um, you know, I, I don't think it's possible to, uh, you know, develop, uh, you, you know, a, a labor movement or an independent uh, movement, you know, that has support from the, you know, la official labor movement without, you know, taking on the issue of the union bureaucracy. And I think this really came out, you know, I think when, you know, you can look back at various periods of history, but certainly the Labor Party Advocates Initiative in the in the 1990s, you know, where I think a lot of the unions and mainly because of the betrayal of the Clinton administration to workers, um, you know, started moving towards developing, uh, you know, Labor Party advocates and talking about a Labor Party advocates. But I think one of the third rail of, uh, you know, sort of labor politics is, uh, you know, if you're a low-level staffer or you're anyway incorporated into the union bureaucracy, there's a number of things that can end your career pretty quickly. And, you know, one of those is, uh, you know, advocating a break from a Democratic Party, especially when there's like an active challenge uh, to the Democrats. Uh, it's just a fundamental to the sort of ideology and functioning of the of the national unions or even a lot of the local unions today uh, that uh, you, you, you're not free to break free from it. I think historically we've seen the same thing with, you know, international affairs, you know, especially back in the period from the 40s up until the fall of the Soviet Union, um, where when I started in the labor movement, extreme red baiting. So you couldn't, it, it, so, so I think the point here is that there's certain things that are incompatible uh, with business unionism. And these are features of class struggle unionism. And I think truly independent politics is, is, is one of those. 
Um, so, so for that reason, uh, you know, and also supporting when you have active reform movements that are challenging, like the P9 struggle in the 80s or a lot of the rank and file movements that were fighting concessions, it, they, those were incompatible with a, with a sort of political position that allowed you to coexist with business unionism. So, so I think really today, I, I, I think that, you know, the questions are, you know, somewhat uh, inseparable. And, um, and, and and really, you know, I, I think I'd spend a lot of time, and, and what I like about the book is, and to go back to the book is, you know, a lot of people say, you know, here's a number of reasons why we can't have independent labor politics, and they're all sort of structural or pragmatic. Um, I think Kim's book puts politics in command. It's really a question of ideology and a question of, uh, you know, what is your, uh, you know, political stance, uh, which is key. And I think that the same question comes out um, in terms of how do we, you know, build class struggle unions. And I, I think in many ways they're the same questions um, that we need to, you know, sort of uh, sharpen up, you know, what are the differences between, you know, how would we have talked about it in the 1970s? I mean, I was still in the, uh, uh, you know, you know I, that was a little bit before my time, but I caught the tail end of it. Uh, folks are still around, but I think there was a lot sharper line in terms of how do we think about these questions? You know, how, how do we analyze things? And um, I, I, I think until we kind of get back to, you know, sort of more of the development of that theory. So really, you know, just say, so no, I got a couple minutes left. Um, you know, I, I I talk a lot about the development from the 1980s on of this, what I call labor liberalism, but it's this idea and it's really situated among the union staffers and lower union staffers or folks who are even, you know, elected, but they don't want to break with the established bureaucracies. And it's a sort of set of ideas that allow you to feel good about yourself and to, and to hold progressive ideas without fundamentally challenging the system of labor bureaucracy. And I think in many ways we have a similar process taking place with um, the electoral politics and with uh, DSA. So there's this development where, you know, you can take progressive positions and you can, you know, push the issues, but, you know, you can't really fundamentally break with the party structure. And, and if you do, you get brought to heel pretty quickly. And, and there's a lot of pressures that they're able to put on you uh, to develop that. So I think, um, you know, fundamentally, you know, confronting those questions. I think Kim had a, you know, chapter on, you know, Jane McElvey in, 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 in the book or not fully on her. Um, I, I, I actually would like that discussion to get sharpened up a little bit because I think in many ways, you know, that sort of philosophy is what I'm talking about where it coexists with the sort of labor bureaucracy. So seeing the strike as a structure test rather as a mini revolution, you know, a lot of those similar concepts, I think we could spend a whole discussion about what are the differences. Um, and then just finally, um, I'm in wrapping it up, you know, when I think about it, you know, one of Kim's great contributions is the, 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 the rank and file strategy, um, which is really, you know, fundamentally how, you know, a guide for how socialists should relate to the labor movement and that the, the sort of struggle on the shop floor produces a certain consciousness. So I guess I'm kind of interested in, you know, the, the, the sort of Bernie campaign and DSA's growth. Those were all sort of electoral manifestations of class struggle. And to what extent does the class, the rank and file strategy apply to that? Like, is that, you know, something that we would take that concept and say, you know, applying that on the on the grassroots level, because where you're pushing it, that's how you develop the consciousness. Because I think certainly that's developed a, probably a lot more consciousness through those campaigns than we've done in, you know, a, a long time in the labor movement. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe. That was really excellent. Um, our and last but not least, Lois will make her comments, and then we'll throw this back to Kim. Lois, it's yours. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm going to read my comments because I have a lot to say, and that's the only way I can uh, cram everything in. So apologies for that. Um, Kim's work has been my touchstone since 1990 
in understanding education reform when I became a researcher and a college professor and, co and teacher educator. And so I'm very grateful to Spectre, Haymarket and Kim for including me in this conversation. Uh, I want to apologize in my bio for not having included the fact that my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I also want to point out that I'm a professor emerita, which means that I'm a female retired professor. Um, my thoughts about Kim's book, indeed all of my writing and thinking as a career teacher and union activist, I have never been staff, for 50 years have depended on the courage and political acuity of tens of thousands of teachers and education workers in the U.S. and globally. The militancy of our movement has shown that teachers are workers who have much to teach the left and labor about principled struggle for dignity as workers, along with social, political, and economic equality and justice with allies and social movements. And it is that which informs my comments about Kim's work. Breaking the impasse comes at a historical moment that is overripe with possibility and danger. And so I say first to the audience, as someone who too often winks at the need to read a book rather than just read reviews or listening to panels such as this, this is a book you must read. Kim does not recapitulate arguments you've heard before, but reframes them. He draws on knowledge acquired in a lifetime of studying labor economy and integrates this with material about U.S. politics and its electoral system. He draws on work that has been neglected to our detriment. And in this, I have to point out Arthur Lippo's book on the political system. The book's brilliance, that's a term I use in my blurb, might be seen as hyperbolic, but I think it's captured in the term impasse. Although I have long seen the Democratic Party can deliver help we need immediately, and it can, I have also understood that it will betray our real interests as workers and human beings. So I have understood and experienced the, contribution, the contradiction that Kim describes as an impasse, I have understood it and experienced it as a dilemma, which is a situation requiring a choice between equally undesirable alternatives. In contrast, the term impasse and Kim's analysis of it restore our agency by explaining how workers, labor, activism, and social movements, in particular the struggle for black liberation, can together create the social and political force needed to develop a new kind of politics and the electoral alternative we so desperately need. The book embodies the dialectic between theory and practice, so often missing in political debates and popular publications, which I will not mention, and academic Marxism, which I will not identify. He explains how the fight for democracy in the workplace, the unions in our society, is the essence and driving principle of what is called the rank and file strategy. And in my opinion, the book demolishes, politely of course, because that's who Kim is, other stances towards union reform and unions' relationship to the Democratic Party and electoral politics. Kim's book challenges and inspires us to think differently. And in my remaining three and a half minutes, I want to explore some of these challenges. Kim's book focuses on what the left has traditionally considered work in the working class. It mostly omits cultural and knowledge workers, as well as those who do paid work of social reproduction historically women's work. While the analysis is persuasive about changes to work in the global supply chain, changes to other kinds of work, mostly by information technology, are mostly ignored. And here I'm thinking of ideas contributed by Ursula Hughes. The importance of the omission is seen in what is arguable, arguably the most widespread militant organizing occurring today among knowledge workers, like those in media and higher education, as well, of course, among workers in pre-K-12 schools. 
I think this omission relates to another challenge captured in the book's organization, which Kim partly explains by saying he wrote it a while ago, the existence of a separate final chapter, which focuses on the strategic, moral, and political importance of the movement for black liberation. Kim's explanation of why a rank and file strategy to revitalize, I would say to create a labor movement driven by a commitment to democracy, I think suggests we need to adopt a conceptual frame that allows us to ground our analysis of the self emancipation of the working class with understandings of how and why social oppression is endemic to capitalism. Elsewhere, I propose that the term neoliberalism, while accurate in describing capitalism's ideology for 40 years, has also obscured the explanatory power of the longtime frame of socialists, which I know Kim is familiar with, analyzing capitalism as a social system. Understanding capitalism as a global so social system also demands that we adopt an international outlook as Kim's work has consistently done. The task now for all of us who see the ravages of capitalism is building a mass social upsurge to break the stranglehold of billionaires over our daily existence. Kim's book explains in readable, persuasive language how foregrounding the fight for democracy in our society and unions opens our eyes to opportunities obscured by the strategies that essentially tinker with the status quo. We have time to change the future, and I think Kim's book supports us to see how to make that happen. Okay, thank you very much, Lois. Uh, Kim, you have about 10 minutes to respond, engage, whatever, all yours. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you all for uh... Or these observations, you know, positive and, and critical and all the rest of it. Uh, I, I can't really answer all of them, but I'm going to try to touch on some of the ones that, you know, I think are, are important. Um, I would just say, um, you know, about analyzing, not using shorthand like neoliberalism and, and analyzing uh, what's going on with capitalism and everything. I, I would have to agree with that. And, you know, all I can say is that the problem is when you sit down to write a book uh, of, of any kind, you kind of have to decide what level of analysis you're going to use and all the rest of it. So, yes, I took the cheap shortcut of, of using neoliberalism and didn't really go into uh, my view on it, which has to do with, the, you know, the falling rate of profit and all of that, but also as a total social system, which is what Lois was getting at, the crisis of reproduction, uh, you know, the, the multiple crises. I mean, I mentioned multiple crises there, um, but I didn't really get into all of them. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that that is what this period is about, that we do face a, a multiple crises, that for all I have to say about the civil rights movement or even Black Power or the Black Panthers and so forth, uh, in my own background, it's clear that things for the vast majority of African Americans and other people of color have gotten worse, you know, much worse. And they're going to, you know, and, and this, the Democrats, to get back to them, who would have been the party you would expect to do something about it, didn't do something about it, they contributed to it and consistently, I would argue. Uh, you know, we can look at the Clinton administration in particular on, on the whole question of incarceration, uh, of, of militarizing the police, and, and all the rest of it, and it goes right through the Obama administration. Uh, and right now, uh, you know, we know that, that Biden is not going to do anything about this, and uh, it doesn't appear that he can do much of anything about anything at, at, at the moment, which is another problem. Um, people have asked some various things, and I, I wanted to, um, you know, sort of, I'll, I'll skip the getting back to the labor bureaucracy for a moment, though that is key to so many of these questions, um, because it, it, it plays a role in holding back, in, in a certain way, 
the, the organized sections of the class, you know, that, that could do more uh, if, if they had a different type of way of looking at things themselves, not just their, their leaders themselves. But where did they learn that? People, for example, wonder, well, why did so many people, you know, call for Trump on the whole question of imports and all of that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the labor bureaucracy has been telling them that's the main problem for 30 or 40 years now. And so naturally, uh, when they hear someone come along and say, well, I'm going to stop this, I'm going to do this about China, et cetera, et cetera, you know, well, you know, it, uh, it makes too much sense to them, even though we know that what he's doing with that, you know, is not even so much about trade or, or anything like that, but it's about building uh, <coughs> white supremacist movement, which uh, is uh, unfortunately all too successful at the moment. Um, Question about, <clears throat> for example, the role of, of DSA in, uh, in, in, in the question of electoral politics and in the question of how do we break, uh, you know, from, from the Democratic Party and all of that. I think, first of all, I have to say something that I don't think many people are saying, and I didn't say it in the book because I didn't really grasp it when I, when I wrote the book, but I have grasped it recently. DSA is is trying to act like a political party. And what I mean by that is that they're they're running and endorsing people and expecting these people to go by the DSA program. Well, that sounds very reasonable. Uh, and of course, they should do that. But the problem is that there's no organic link between the, the, the candidates and the people who serve in Congress or state legislatures or even city councils when it comes to voting on the police and things like that. There's no organic Link, you know, and so uh, it, it creates um, turmoil in, in DSA, but it also means that DSA, as it's as it's constructed, you know, can't be the party of the future. It can't be uh, itself, you know, the, the the sort of thing that we need. What it can do is play a big role in that. What was that? Five uh, minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, it can play a big role in that. And, and I would argue that right now, the biggest role that we play is what many, many thousands of DSA members are in fact doing, which is working to change their union, helping Amazon people organize or Starbucks people, and now it's Target. And, you know, it'll be somebody next week else and so on. You have thousands of, of young people, so many of whom hold these jobs or similar jobs, uh, they they can play a role in, in you know helping this to to move. If you look back at I didn't go into this a lot in the thing on the 30s and so forth. But who were the people who, who led the strikes in Flint and, and in other places? You know they were Socialist Party members, Communist Party members, old IWW people, and so forth. People we call the militant minority, conscious radicals uh, who could play a leadership role. Well, you've got you know, people uh, in, in the DSA who are already doing many of these kinds of work, but from what I can see, it, it, it lacks greater coherence and, and leadership and direction and, and so forth. The, the resolutions passed, uh, you know, are, are all things for all people, frankly, and, you know, that, that, that's not going to cut it. So getting clearer on what is a priority for DSA as an organization, as a strategy, which doesn't mean everybody has to get a union job or anything like that. It doesn't mean nobody can be a staffer or, or anything like that. But it does mean that you have to have your eye uh, and, and your, your, your person in the rank and file. You've got to be fighting there, uh, you know, for, for these sort of things. So I think Building the mass movement that, that, you know, I talk about a lot. Uh, I can't tell you how to build a mass movement except to participate in it and to have the, the kind of politics that lead you to see that organizing the rank and file, uh, you know, um, is, is what works, if anything works. And I had some personal experience in this, and my years and years at Labor Notes gave me indirect but very close up personal uh, you know, experience in what people were doing in various unions uh, to, to change things and how people organize rank and file things. And it's not easy and it's not simple. 
And you can't just go in there and say, we're going to do uh, socialist politics today, uh, you know, after you've been on the job for six months or something like that. But you can become part of that and you can talk, can talk to your fellow workers. Even back in the 60s and 70s when red baiting was still a big thing, we could do that. If you could do it then, you can sure do it now. So I think these things are are uh, very important. Um, what else here? Sorry, uh, the Labor Party. What happened to Tony Masaki and the Labor Party? Now we supported that, or I, I was involved in that to some extent. Uh, what happened was, I think uh, Joe actually described it. What happened was that. Tony had the idea, and he's a unique person in the American labor movement. You know, I had a lot of respect for him. But he had the idea that you, you had to do this by affiliating the big unions and so forth. And he got about a half a dozen of them to affiliate, and, and a lot of locals and some regional things, and like the California nurses and all that. I went to their two conventions. These were inspiring things. This was a multicultural working class right there in a big room representing all these unions and everything. Uh, the problem is it had no place to go. It was a Labor Party that wasn't going to run candidates because if you're going to try to get the unions affiliated, you have to get the bureaucracy on your side, and the bureaucracy was never going to do that, uh, just never going to do that. Maybe a couple of the smaller unions that you read or something, but for the most part, that was not going to happen. And that was the that was the end of the Labor Party on it. Total amount of time. Maybe later I can get back to some of the other. What happens now? Okay, Kim. Uh, thank you, Kim. Um, what happens now is I'm getting questions from uh, from people who are watch who are in the audience, and I'll start posing them. We have about 25 minutes to to kick those around before we have to uh, wrap up. And I'll throw them first to Kim. And if uh, other speakers want to speak, please just use a little ha hand raising emoji so that I can recognize you. All right. Um, you answered one of the questions about why did the labor U.S. Labor Party fizzle out. So let me uh, let me raise some other questions. The one question that was raised, I think that is quite is sort of the one that's lurking behind everything is when and how should the left engage in electoral politics? We've seen the attempt by the left to intervene in the Democratic Party. We've seen unsuccessful attempts to run as third party candidates. How and when should the left engage in electoral politics to promote independent class politics? Kim, why don't you start off? Okay, that actually relates to a question that I think um, Kim had about uh, the nitty gritty of, of building these kind of independent politics we're talking about. This is not something, I, I'm not advocating the sort of thing like the Green Party, that is, that is a party that doesn't really have a social base. It has a good issue. I'm not saying nobody should ever vote for the Green Party, but I, I am saying that isn't the way to go. This has to come out of the movements that are developing in, in the different communities. Uh, the, the tenant organizing, the, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, um, you know, these these kind of things, getting the people who are the leaders and the activists in these movements on the idea that in their neighborhood, I won't talk about communities, that's a misused word, but in their neighborhoods, uh, they, they, you know, can begin building things uh, and in their unions. And again, I don't want a party that's based, I, I think Joe is right, we'll never have a party based on, on the official endorsements by the international unions, etc. That isn't going to happen. But we can get locals behind something like this in, in a given area. Uh, you know, they're, they're not doing it now, but that's partly because here's these, these uh, well, I think 67,000 dues paying DSA members are not pushing for it in these unions. That, that would help. Um, and then in order to, to build something like that, I've done some electoral work, and, and I think all of it that I did was basically wrong. It was the, you just did the election like it was an election, and you just went for the votes, and, and that, was, that was pretty much it. Uh, we can't do that. We have to build it like it was a community organization. We have to build it block by block, workplace by workplace in, in the areas. 
get people to sign up, build membership, dues-paying democratic membership organizations on the ground in neighborhoods. And I would say, you know, just to begin, target these these one-party districts. We can't stop there, but that's a starting point. Uh, you know, it, it is a good place to do that. And <clears throat> so, you know, I, I can't go much beyond the, the details of how to do that. Uh, I was a community organizer too once, and you know, you just you go door to door and you talk to people about the issue you want to get them to work on, and you try to, to build some kind of organization out of that. I think that's what we have to do. We have the numbers now to begin that. And I'm not saying we should run candidates this year or something like that. We're not ready for that. But begin laying the basis. Begin talking to the people we work with in the unions and, and the social movements, uh, you know, about this idea that there is an alternative. There is actually a different way to do it. People in American history have tried to do it. It's true, no one succeeded. We could go through the reasons for that. I don't think it's just the first past the post thing. I think that's a cop out explanation. Um, social movements and unions have weaknesses. We all know that, you know, and we have to address those things too. Like more and more the climate change movement, even to some extent Black Lives Matter, are going the NGO route. This is this is death. Uh, you will not build a militant mass movement by using the NGO model. Uh, you know, so that's something else we have to be critical of. And of course, it's difficult because you know, nobody wants to listen to our criticisms of everything under the sun. But I think we can present ideas in a positive way. People like the idea of democracy. They like the idea of grassroots politics, uh, you know, and community politics and, and building things in the workplace that, that are that are power. That's that's what I think is the way to go. That's not very detailed, I realize, but that is where we start, uh, you know, I think. So all right. Both Lois and Kian would like to uh Way in. So, Lois, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think that Kim hit the nail on the head when he described democratic dues paying organizations, uh, because I, I think that gets at exactly the problem of, of the Democrats and the Republicans not being membership organizations that are controlled by the members, right? And so the issue that that's raised that raises is accountability and responsibility and who's calling the shots and democracy, really. And the one place that we should be starting this is in cities where teachers unions represent more workers than any other union. That's, the, that, that's true. It's the single union in many places that represents far more workers. And the Chicago Teachers Union is facing this right now, right? The same thing is true with UTLA. It, it's true in every major city that we have this possibility. And so I think, though, that we need to understand that to reach out to social movements, you can't just say, join us. We have to show up for them. Yeah. We have to show up for them first. That's, that's the issue. We need to show up for movements for social justice, and then we have the credibility to ask them to join us in these democratic organizations and form something new that we haven't seen before. Okay, Kian. You know, yeah, uh, I agree a lot with what uh, uh, Lois just said and, and just listening uh, to Kim speak, it kind of made me think about um, a few things. One is, the similar the similarity between sort of the, the, the labor bureaucracy's strategy, which I I kind of think of it as trickle down, I don't know, trickle down change or something like that, basically, right? Uh, all the resources are oriented towards uh, the Democratic Party, who will then deliver some kind of I don't know change or benefits to the to the workers in some way, and then I think it's it's a similar there's a similar phenomenon in terms of what we're seeing with some of the electoral strategies that are playing out in, in, in DSA and other left uh, organizations where the goal is to get the right people in office and then that office will then provide resources back to, I don't know, to the, to the movement or whatever. So you see kind of like this mix of mobilize, get the people in office, get resources, change will happen that way. 
And what I hear Kim saying is we're talking about building the kind of party we're going to have to build is going to be block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. And it raises this concern that I've kind of been, you know, kicking around in my head in terms of how people are engaging with the rank and file strategy um, and thinking of rank and file strategy as a means of capturing uh, their union and then turn their union into the supporter of, you know, independent working class politics or, you know, being a base for uh, uh, for that, you know, for for maybe a third party electoral challenge, but without thinking about the, the path towards, say, union reform as being helping co-workers not only deal with the shop floor issues, but beginning to have those conversations about the broader community issues, beginning to build sort of the foundation for this party that might be neighborhood by neighborhood or, or block by block, right? Um, so I, that's just something that came up for me in, um, in thinking about the rank and file strategy and, and how it's how people are thinking about it and, and whether we're thinking about it the right way. Okay, a um, couple of, there's two questions that just, that from the uh, chat that from the audience that are pretty much intertwined and I'd like give Kim an opportunity and others possibly. First is how can the labor movement present itself as a vehicle for black, Latino and the liberation of racially oppressed peoples in the US? Particularly the questioner asked, because of the attachment to the Democratic Party by many, many African Americans, Latinx people, other people of color, immigrants, is the view that the Democrats are the vehicle for some sort of attack on racial oppression. And then the other question is, the other comment was that you can respond to is the labor movement makes to make clear that bodily autonomy is a core issue. Control over our bodies is a century old battle to control our labor and they can't be separated from one other. And this is of course coming up in its most stark form around the threat to repeal, to overturn Roe versus Wade, but has broader context in the attack on trans people, et cetera. So Kim, why don't you start off? All right. Ooh, ah, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, well, first of all, just to, 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 to Lois, two things I absolutely agree with. The cities, that's the place to start. Not to end, but it's the place to start. Uh, it goes with the other things we're talking about. The cities in their immediate periphery, uh, but, the, but the cities. And the way to convince people is to show up. That's absolutely right. You know, and, and when we as socialists were doing things in the 60s and 70s, I mean, that's what we did. That was kind of an ABC, that if you wanted people to listen to you or to support your cause, not necessarily even socialism, but say your strike or something else, uh, your civil rights march or something like that, you have to show up for them. Uh, and it's not easy because that means that's a lot of time, you, you know, and all of that. And it's one reason why, you know, the, the why why most people don't do that because it's easier to try to build the quote the coalition, meaning a lot of endorsements, you know, and official things like that, rather than showing up for the demonstration, showing up for the sit-in, showing up for whatever it is, the rally, uh, you know, and 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 trying to do that consistently. And that's not going to be easy. But if you have a large organization like DSA, and if you can point some of the active members, whose members you know are, are above the hundreds for once, uh, you can begin. Everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. Uh, so you can. Some people work in this movement. Some people work in that movement. So on and so forth. But I think that's uh, that's really important. And, and the idea of, again, it, it um, comes back to the rank and file idea. The idea is building democratic grassroots organization. In that particular case in the unions, in the workplace in the union. But it also carries over into any 
you know, sort of sort of other thing. And and I, I think that some of the articles I've seen that talk about the rank and file strategy coming from BSA or even Brown Moses, uh, that kind of knew what Cam was saying about, you know, well, we're gonna do this and then we'll have enough people to elect more AOCs and more Bernies and all the rest of it. And I think that is is wrong. Um, even in terms of the idea of building an independent workers' party, each movement has to have its own integrity. We want to find a way to bring them together. It's, it's absolutely true, and to help each other in the in these things. But each movement has to be taken seriously in, in its own right, or it won't go anywhere. Uh, you know, so you can't take something like, let's say, PDU and have it endorse every everything under the sun. It's it's got to have you know, integrity. They have to deal with these issues in, in their own thing, you know, which they've done by having like a black caucus, a women's caucus, and things like this. Uh, but, you know, you can, and having a lot of information on their website about people's rights and things like that. But you, you have to recognize that each kind of movement does have a certain integrity that has to be respected. So that makes it complicated to bring things up, that even showing up uh, you know, which I think is the right thing, is, is not often going to be enough. And how do we do that? Well, I think the more people we get into the streets, you know, and when I think about the 60s and 70s, how is it that public sector people got organized in, in the late 60s and into the 70s? The answer, there's, there's three words to it. Civil rights movement. That's what did it. I was involved in that, organizing uh, the social workers in Baltimore. And I can tell you the reason it was so easy then is that half the people who worked there were veterans or were influenced by that movement. And everything we did around that, building a, a multiracial union with a multiracial leadership from day one, you know, made sense to people. And so I think that the, these these are the kinds of, you know, answers that don't deal with, with every question, but um, you know, I think um, it, it's the way we have to uh, approach these things. Recognize the, the, the integrity of each movement, but get them into the streets together as much as possible. Uh, you can do all kinds of things when you're doing political work in the union. You can be building a rank and file caucus on the one hand and doing something else. When I was in a telephone worker, it was ages ago, of course, but okay, we were building a little rank and file group on the one hand, but then it was time, this is in New York, time for the big anti-war demonstration. Well, we organized the contingency of telephone workers, three quarters who didn't want anything to do with our rank of power group, but they sure wanted to get out there and protest against this war that was killing people they knew and, and so forth. So you, you can do more than one thing at, at the same time, but recognize the integrity of, of each of these things. So that's part of what uh, I would say. I'm, I'm, Sure, I'm not answering all these questions, so people want to shoot them again. They can do that. Okay, uh, Lois, your hand is up. My hand is up. Um, I think Kim's uh, term that uh, recognizing the integrity of the movement, that is the independence of the movement, is exactly right. Uh, what I want to say, though, is that the broader question is how we negotiate tensions between workers' conservative political at attitudes and union organizing. And that's the reality, that many workers have conservative political attitudes. So that's the reality. And I think this, the, our task, it, which re, relates to the rank and file strategy, is to redefine workers' self-interest. That's the key. To, and the best way and the most powerful means to help people redefine their self-interest is when they are in struggle. So I'll give you an example. When the Arizona teachers started to organize in their walkout, uh, I was on social media and I saw that all the faces were white of the organizers. This is in Arizona, a state that has an enormous Hispanic population. I said, you have bilingual teachers, right? And it's important that you have the support of immigrant parents, is it not? So they didn't even think of that connection. Right, that the bilingual teachers were their immediate connection to immigrant parents. 
And they changed the way they presented themselves as a movement. And it, the struggle was a process of political education. And I know for sure that not all Arizona teachers support a, abolition of ICE. I know that. Yet a process of political education occurred because they were involved in a struggle for things that were important to them, defense of public education, their salaries, defense of kids. And they saw that in order to do that, that support from the community was extremely important. And they reached out and they changed. They changed their face, they changed the faces, and they changed people's minds. That's the process of political education and help people to redefine what they see as their self-interest. Okay. Um, I'm going to meld together because we only have about seven minutes left, a couple of questions. And the first one is, we've seen, Kim, a big uptick in organizing. Breakthrough at the one warehouse at Amazon, the incredible wave of victories, NLRB victories at Starbucks, the beginnings of organizing at, uh, at uh, Target, etc. Um, the two the questions that have come in is, that I want to sort of put together are: How does a rank and file perspective, a rank and file strategy, or what Joe's called class struggle unionism? How does that, what import does that have for organizing the unorganized, which has often been a claim, particularly in some currents in DSA, that the rank and file strategy is just for the shrinking minority of organized workers. And then related to that, what role can student labor alliances and alliances with whatever existing social movement organizations that have not become totally NGOized are going to be how important, what kind of role could those potentially play in new organizing? Uh, okay, I get to go. All right. Uh, I think this is this, this, this question of how does the rank and file strategy or class struggle unions relate to organizing? To me, it, it, it's fundamental to it. You know, if we think how unions got organized, whether you're talking about public sector workers in the 70s or people in the 30s or, or people now organizing in Amazon, is the first thing to remember is that these people organized themselves first. It wasn't some organizer that came, you know, from the Teamsters or whatever, you know, that, that organized most of these workers. They, they began organizing themselves. They might get help from the union later on and so forth, or they might get stopped by you later on in some cases, uh, but they began by organizing themselves. And just like we respect the independence of movements, we should respect that and not have the attitude, I hate to say it about Jane Mackler, but not have the attitude that you're only a, a, an organizer if you're a professional staff trained, multi-year type organizer. If we wait for that, it won't happen. It will happen because it begins to come from the inside. Okay, that's the first thing. And what we say to people who are doing that is build your democratic organization now. Don't wait for your NLRB election. That's too late because they will come after you. Once you win your election, they're going to come after you like gangbusters, uh, much more than they did in, in, the, in the election itself. So get your organization together, build a rank and file organization, whether you're in an official union, whether you're in the Amazonians United or the new IWW thing in Virginia or whatever it is, build a rank and file organization that has power in the workplace and the ability to take direct action if needs be. You know, so that's how that, that relates. And, and the problem is the reason we haven't organized as a labor movement very many people uh, in, in the last, what, I don't know, three quarters of a century or something like that, is that it's all, it's all been done as part of an official process, a bureaucratic process. Bureaucratic, not only in the sense of the union, but in the sense of the whole structure of the, the NLRB and, and all of that. Everything is legalized and turned into, you know, this case and that case and so forth. And yes, we have to sometimes use these 
things to protect ourselves, you know, we file a case for the NLRB to protect ourselves and so forth. But if we try to organize on the basis of legality and, and of this context that, that has that was actually not so great in the first place and has become totally dysfunctional and functional for the employers, although it's true that, that the Biden NLRB is better than the previous ones and so forth. Nonetheless, you know, don't depend on that. Organize your power yourself. And I believe, frankly, that if Amazon is to be organized, it's going to take strikes. It's going to take those kind of things to do it. NLRB elections, Starbucks is one thing. It's kind of different. And, and because if you look at NLRB elections for the last three or four years, like I, I did a couple of months ago, a few months ago, you see that most of the elections that win are small units. The only big units that win are nurses and graduate students. Most of the other big units uh, lose. Now, of course, the, the AOU thing in, in New York is, is a wonderful exception, and we hope that there are many more such exceptions and so on. But I think the, the real thing here is that, yes, the rank and file approach to organizing is what organizing always should have been in the first place. We shouldn't have to have a rank and file movement to do democratize the union because it should be democratic in the first place. You know, we shouldn't have to uh be strike illegally because it should be a basic human right to be able to do that but we know we have to fight these things so and the way we do that is by organizing at the grassroots or in the case of the union we call it the rank and file um and, and so forth and, and you can't have that perspective without recognizing the role of the labor bureaucracy as, as joe and you know, others have, have said um, that's just the reality. So I, I think I'm very heartened by, by the fact that most of the new things that are happening are coming out of the workplaces and not out of the big office in Washington, D.C. or wherever it is. Uh, you know, I think that's uh, that's a hopeful sign. We haven't seen that for, for quite a while. Uh, Joe, we've got about two minutes, two, three minutes before I have to wrap up. So why don't you make a you wanted to weigh in on this? Okay, just r real briefly, um, I, I, I think folks who pit, you know, sort of the rank and file strategy or rank and file approach against organizing are incorrect. And, you know, we, we cannot organize the unorganized without um, putting our trade unions on a class struggle basis. I mean, we got 93% of the private sector unorganized. Um, the tasks that we have are great. Um, I know everyone likes to look at the latest little bright spot, but we've won some elections with Starbucks and so forth. But to take on these corporations, it's going to take class struggle tactics, class struggle ideology, and it's going to take, you know, the resources and organization uh, uh, on a big scale. So I, I think that, you know, the, the, the sort of philosophy and, it, you know, I think it ties into this electoral stuff as well. You're going to have these outbreaks of, of uh you know, discontent happening and, you know, to sort of deepen them, we need, you know, both our own uh, philosophy and tactics and organization. And I think, you know, you just to tie back into Kim's work, you know, I think that's, you know, where the idea that in order to carry all that out and refound our unions and engage in class struggle, that socialists need to orient towards the rank and file. So I think the two fit very much together. Okay, thank you all for participating. This has been excellent. Kim, thank you for staying up so late in London. Joe, getting up so early in Hawaii. Lois and Kian were in the same time zone. Uh, but thank you very much. This was a really excellent discussion. Please, folks, buy and read this book. Even if you don't agree with its arguments and conclusions, it should be the subject of serious discussion and debate on the left. And again, uh, I'd like to thank Haymarket for organizing this. And I really want to encourage you to subscribe to Spectre. We have a new issue at the printer, should be mailed out soon. If you put in your subscription in the next couple of days, you will get it on time. We have an excellent interview on race and capitalism with Kianga Yamahata Taylor, and a wonderful piece on the abortion struggle in Argentina by Camila Valle. An excellent, excellent piece by John Clark on the rise of campism. Two provocations, one by Wilson Sherman, 
on the relationship between police prison abolition and the abolition of work. And one of our own editors, Aaron Jaffe, is intervening in some of the discussions around Marxism, the Enlightenment, and philosophy. So please stay tuned for future events by Haymarket and Haymarket Inspector, and we will be, uh, excuse me, we will be in touch. Thank you very much again. Great, great panel, comrades. Oh, really sorry. I didn't.